Hello and welcome to CC Saturdays. My name is Prasenjit Singh and today we'll discuss Service Mesh. So uh, the main theme of the day is Service Mesh and this relates to a previous session where we discussed microservices and monoliths. So we'll take it from there and proceed further. And uh, apart from understanding what Service Mesh is, uh, we'll also watch a demonstration from Christian Posta about multi-cloud Istio. So Istio is a service mesh. Uh, and uh, we begin from a base level, like even if you do not know what a service mesh is, that's absolutely fine. So we'll take it from there and understand what a service mesh is and move on. All right. So uh, what are we talking about? Understanding service mesh concepts. And then we are going on to learn uh, about Istio and uh, about multi-cloud Istio. So that would be a demonstration from Christian. All right. So in order to understand what service mesh is, uh, first you would need to understand what problems it is solving. Um, that brings us to the old session where we discussed about monoliths and microservices. So traditionally, uh, applications are monolith, meaning one program which is built as one binary and it runs as one process. So monoliths are simple, but they come with their challenges. Uh, for example, they are hard to scale. Uh, if a single component of your application needs to scale, you need to scale the entire application. Uh, they are hard to release or deploy because everything within Monolith is tightly coupled and any change you do uh, in the application could affect other parts of the code. Now, if you have multiple teams trying to make the change, then just imagine uh, what kind of difficulty you're going to get into and um, third point is uh, there would be a reduced technology flexibility trying new technology without migrating the whole code base to it is problematic and uh, finally uh, the impact on the team's dynamic uh, will be very harsh like uh, it is harder to draw borders of responsibility assign roles develop teams when you're developing a monolith because it's all one application so you do not know who is uh, uh, the correct guy who could guide you to with the login module uh, compared to the shopping cart module for example so it's difficult now uh, to solve this problem microservices come to the rescue and people start building microservices uh, where uh, you have a monolith but it is now broken down into uh, its logical modules like front end and ui is different uh, back end logic is separated databases storages are separated and um, each uh, of this has an independent function. So once uh, this is um, working as uh, a distributed architecture, uh, then uh, most of the problems that we discussed with monoliths are solved. So we got rid of uh, problems with monolith by introducing microservices but that also brings uh, across a new challenge like microservices need to talk to each other for example if you have four microservices a b c and d maybe a need to talk to b uh, or a need to talk to c and c needs to talk to d and so on so that uh, if there is an inter-process communication only then you can get the correct response from that uh, entire software stack so what is the problem with this communication? The problem gets magnified when um, 
you have n number of binaries running around for example now if you have four services a b c and d you have four binaries now if you have uh, multiple instances of each of these services then you have even more so uh, say for example if you have um, three instances each of each microservice so now you are dealing with 12 microservices now there could be outages like one node dies somewhere and is not responding and uh, you have to and um, uh, you, since you are using something like um, kubernetes to orchestrate your nodes then um, the new node comes across gets a new ip address somewhere in the cluster and gets uh, hosted in some uh, worker node where it wasn't in the previous run so how how does these uh, things get solved so it creates a lot of problems one of them is uh, service discovery and uh, that is the problem which i spoke about like for example service a needs to talk to b c to d and so on since uh, each service can be scheduled anywhere and migrates between servers as they come and go. So how does the service A know which server to connect to to talk to B? Because maybe the instance where B was running is now killed and B is up in some other uh, worker node. So that is an important part, the uh, problem that needs to be solved, service discovery. Then comes another problem with microservices that is traffic management so you need to know the routes or if the dynamics change then the routes uh, have to be uh, revalidated so that is another problem then there is a problem with security because the communication in within microservices um, is not encrypted and if someone gets access to the network where the microservices are running all the inter-process communication can be intercepted so these are the problems and also yeah because you have multiple microservices uh, tracing errors is difficult because um, the entire call flow goes through uh, many services and so if there is some error in a certain service uh, then finding that error and tracing it is difficult so that is another challenge now most of these challenges have been solved already but in order to solve that we had to use certain things and that is what um, service mesh is so maybe service mesh will help us solve these problems so let's explore a bit more and see what service mesh is and how will it help us solve the problem well when we talk about service meshes we talk about uh, various kind of solutions that help us to overcome the problems that we just discussed one of them is a api gateway so what is a api gateway we spoke about the challenge where um, the services need to talk to each other seamlessly so there should be some static kind of an address that uh, allows the calls to be routed uh, between services for the inter-process communications so how does that happen uh, in order to facilitate that we use something called an api gateway well it is a uh, a simple implementation uh, for example api gateway can be just another microservice which has all the routes and all the paths for different apis and uh, when a request comes in it lands in the api gateway and the api gateway uses uh, some sort of a service discovery mechanism to discover uh, where the endpoint lies and then forwards the traffic to those endpoints now there are various uh, ways to have this service discovery done there is a, a tool called hashicorp console there is something from netflix oss that is called eureka and so on so microservices have these kind of tools so api gateways in combination with the service discovery applications allow you to discover your services and route the traffic but here again there is a problem what is that 
well there is a problem of uh, API gateways going down like this becomes a single point of failure here so the solution to that is using a sharded API gateway so what is that uh, well uh, here instead of using a single API gateway you have multiple load balancers each uh, connected to a group of microservices and uh, the services know the addresses of the load balancers and the ports to which they are attached so that way the routing goes on and uh, since these are load balancers they have multiple nodes of microservices uh, behind them so there is a high availability here and so on however when your number of microservices grows it is very difficult to maintain and even uh, not economical at all to maintain lots of load balancers so not a good idea for um, uh, for using sharded api gateways so the problem still remains well there is another sort of a uh, solution here uh, another me mesh uh, service mesh solution uh, solution that is called sidecar proxy well um, uh, sidecar proxy is a method where uh, you take the service mesh logic by that I mean all the logic that defines where the other services are how the routes are how how to discover them all that and you put the logic in another microservice attached to each microservice like every microservice will have a sidecar proxy with it so service a has a sidecar proxy with the service mesh logic service b has the sidecar proxy c and d all of them have the sidecar proxies with them and they contain the service mesh lo logic within themselves so the proxy uh, will transparently intercept the traffic and uh, let the magic happen the sidecar proxy will implement all the service mesh smartness service discovery and so on and you'll know where and how to send traffic encrypt it if needed emit the metrics for measurement and observability and much more like uh, it will it will just work as a centralized uh, api gateway server with service discovery so what happens you are actually embedding uh, api gateway come service discovery code logic to your uh, microservices but they do not run inside your microservices they run as sidecars to your microservices but what are the downsides here on top of adding the complexity to the uh, service deployment process this uh, acts uh, as a extra processing hop for your requests and since the sidecar proxies are also deployed as docker containers they capture infrastructure resources or in other words you are spending more and they are deployed for since they are deployed for uh, both sending and receiving requests uh, so you multiply this latency by two additional processing steps because you have a proxy request comes there goes to the service service returns the response goes to the proxy again and is returned there so you have one extra hop and when there is a request response you have two extra layers uh, or steps so that is the problem um, sidecar proxy has well in order to solve these problems of service meshes we have a service mesh that we call istio this is one of the most popular service meshes which are adopted by uh, lots of uh, cloud providers and 
companies which uh, have deployed their applications as microservices. Now to understand Istio, uh, let's take a, uh, take a step back and go back to our microservice uh, architecture again. Well, service mesh uh, means networking of services. Okay, so here we have multiple microservices and our problem is um, enabling a process to allow them to talk to each other, discover each other securely, have encryption mechanisms in place and it should be economical and fast. So to solve these problems we have service mesh and as I said Istio is one of the uh, service mesh. It is a project which uh, developed uh, different components uh, collaboratively to work as a service mesh uh, product and to manage and control the networking between microservices. In other words, uh, you can say separating the business logic in your microservice and its communication and networking layer. So if you use something like Istio, you're not bothering to take the service mesh logic inside your code uh, or uh, run it as a sidecar there. Istio is something that is going to take care of that part. All right, so how does Istio achieve that? It achieves this by injecting another container in the same application pod in Kubernetes platform and this is called the sidecar and uh, in Istio terms uh, sidecar is called envoy I'll talk about it uh, in a bit all right so uh, what it does um, Istio is injecting another container in the same application pod running in Kubernetes platform and and as I said, uh, uh, this is uh, called Envoy or a sidecar. And so now we have two different containers in one pod. So say you, if you have a service A, so you will have a service A and a service A sidecar, but both of them will run on the same pod in your Kubernetes cluster. Now one is running for your business application and the other is managing uh, the interaction with the other services in the mesh so we can also allocate different resources to these containers as per the requirement of the application and to some extent uh, monolith applications uh, are protected by the single address space once a monolith has been broken into microservices um, the network becomes a, a substantial attack surface so uh, Istio also takes care of that kind of uh, attack like Istio uh, apart from being a sidecar proxy it also uh, takes care of uh, encryption and all other security aspects for different network calls that are coming its way so um, there's a lot of security benefits as well uh, which have which are offloaded from your service so you don't have to think about security aspects um, in your service log code logic so authentication of services are handled by istio uh, it can also handle encryption of traffic and uh, you can even define security policies customized security policies in using Istio. Now, uh, what is Envoy? So, Envoy, as I said, is a high performance uh, proxy. Uh, it is written in C++ and uh, it can handle in both uh, ingress and outgress uh, traffic. Uh, for all the services in the service mesh uh, environment, uh, Envoy can handle the inbound outbound traffic. Envoy proxies are also the only Istio components that interact with the data plane traffic uh, and Envoy proxies are deployed as sidecars to services 
uh, that logically augment the services with Envoy's many built-in features. They can help in uh, dynamic service discovery, Envoy can uh, load balance, Envoy can uh, do TLS termination, uh, Envoy can have circuit breakers. Uh, uh, circuit breaker means for example you want you, know, you you are getting a lot of traffic from a single attacker say someone is uh, doing a ddos attack on your uh, one of your api endpoints and uh, you can set your rules like if there is too much load coming from this particular traffic you can break the circuit or um, or you can limit uh, the calls uh, from a particular uh, request that is failing for example you have an api endpoint that is getting 500 errors so there is no point exposing it and getting more errors and breaking your entire system so if there are say a threshold number of 500 errors from a particular endpoint no more requests are uh, uh, requests are received and that gives time for the backend uh, nodes to come up and cool down so once they are healthy then you get requests again so you can set those kind of circuit breaker rules as well and of course envoy also has uh, the ability to have health checks so it can check health of your um, application containers and likewise uh, inform all the other components about whether the service or a particular microservice is up or not. So that is what Envoy is doing in Istio. And uh, apart from that, uh, Istio has various other components in its architecture. Not very difficult, simple to understand. Let's have a look. Well, this is how Istio looks like. Uh, it has a control plane and a data plane now Envoy is the only component uh, you can see uh, here which um, Will be talking to your business applications like your microservices. So Envoy is talking to service A and service B However, the other components of Istio would be isolated they are not talking they are just controlling the envoy proxies so what is um, what are the components of uh, istio control plane so as you can see in the image the istio control plane has three components well, first one is the pilot uh, the pilot provides uh, service discovery dynamic lookup for new services for envoy sidecars it has traffic management capabilities uh, for intelligent routing um, i mean you can even use pilot to do a b tests canary rollouts and so on blue green deployments and uh, it provides resiliency um, timeouts retry circuit breakers which i spoke about uh, some time ago and pilot converts high level routing rules that control traffic behavior into envoy specific configurations and propagates them to sidecars at runtime so that is what pilot does uh, service discovery and uh, basically controlling the traffic behavior so these are the keywords and then uh, comes citadel citadel enables a strong service to service and end user um, authentication with built-in uh, identity and credential management so basically this is doing the security uh, parts uh, of uh, istio service mesh and uh, using Citadel, operators can enforce policies based on service identity rather than relatively uh, unstable layer 3 or layer 4 network identifiers. So you're not depending upon your network security team. You're already having it in place uh, attached to your services through Istio. If they have more security on their layers, the better. 
okay then the third component you can see in the control plane is the galley galley is Istio's uh, configuration validation injection processing and uh, distribution component so it is uh, responsible for insulating the rest of Istio components from the details of obtaining user configuration from the underlying Kubernetes platform so it is validating requests and uh, ingesting processing and distributing and it is responsible for isolating the control plane from the rest of the Kubernetes so that is pretty much uh, what a service mesh is and how Istio works and uh, um, that is about its architecture, its components, how it is built and when you're working with microservices over multi-cloud, Istio becomes even more relevant because then you need something that can manage the uh, complications. So Istio solves the problem of discovering and routing calls to the best service instance. Aside from linking services, um, However, service meshes can also provide developers with valuable uh, monitoring capabilities, traffic control and security. And when someone is working with uh, microservices specifically on Kubernetes, Istio becomes uh, more important. Well, uh, that completes the first part of our presentation today. and. Uh, Taking it further from here will be uh, a demo video from Christian Posta. Christian is the field CTO at solo.io and uh, he has a lot of experience working with microservices. He's written books uh, for microservices using Java uh, Spring Boot and he's uh, currently involved in a lot of public talks uh, for Istio and is writing a book uh, Istio in action so uh, let's go ahead and watch uh, the video from Christian let me share my screen and uh, and if you can see from my screen I'm gonna I'm gonna go off a little bit of normal normal C and normal script where people show slides and demos I'll, I'll show some demos but um, I also really like you know, I, I can't, nobody's traveling right now, right? And uh, as part of my work as, a, as an architect and, and working with, with customers, I, I really enjoy traveling and being in front of them and, um, you know, talking about solutions and uh, sketching things on, on whiteboards and going back and having that collaborative uh, feel. And that's not something that, that we've been able to, to do. Um, and so one of the formats that I wanted to try for, for at least this, this meetup is, uh, is trying to go back to that drawing board feel and um, sketch concepts as they pop into my head down onto paper or in this case, an iPad and, uh, and, and try to explain, uh, explain and, um, and illustrate some of the, the concepts that come up when people discuss deploying Istio, especially across multiple clusters. Um, we're gonna, we are gonna take a look at a little bit at what, we're, uh, what, what I've been working on and, and the folks here at Sol have been working on in terms of WebAssembly and, uh, and just try to share some, some of this stuff and happy to make it interactive, right? Like I, like I said earlier, the best part was being with people and, uh, and exchanging ideas and, and trying to draw them out. You know, I, I would prefer this to be two-way street so people jump in and ask questions or clarifications or objections and pushback if, uh, if, uh, you, know, if, you, if you see an opportunity for that. So um, with that, thank you for joining the community meeting and uh, cross your fingers. Let's hope the iPad and, the, and everything uh, cooperates here and then uh, let's, let's get going. Uh, okay, so the first thing we, I, I wanted to talk about is, uh, is Istio, deploying Istio into, into multiple clusters. That is a use case that um, we here at, at Solo work very closely with organizations, some extremely large organizations with hundreds, if not more clusters. And some of the folks who are just getting started who might have a single cluster uh, and maybe going into a handful of, uh, of those Istio clusters and, uh, and anything in between. Uh, and I'm gonna focus on a couple of problems. You know, this, this discussion could go on for days, uh, but I'm gonna focus on a couple of problems specifically around what is, what is the model for um, how you 
manage these clusters, how you update the config, what that configuration looks like, uh, some of the complexities that uh, arise in that in those scenarios, what are some of the models. Um, and then we'll get to uh, what well, we'll switch gears completely and use some of, some of the models that we describe and see how that fits in with uh, deploying and managing uh, extensions to the mesh based on WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is, uh, is, is something fairly new that just hit upstream Envoy. And although it has, has been around in various dimensions and flavors in the Istio proxy for a little bit, uh, especially around customization of metrics and so on. Uh, but we can, you know, we're, we're on the cusp of, uh, of being able to use WebAssembly for um, a growing set of use cases to extend the capability of the mesh. And, uh, and in fact, at least here at, at Solo, we are working with some large customers that are putting WebAssembly into production right now, which a month or two ago, I, I would have thought that'd be scary, but uh, it's working out. It's working out really good. So um, let's let's see if I can switch into uh, one, one of these diagrams and let, let's start from the beginning. All right. So if you go to the Istio.io website and look at the documentation, there's a few different flavors for running Istio across multiple clusters. There is the, the model where everything is on the same network, which if you have and can enjoy a situation like that, then by all means, go for it. And what that means is you might run multiple clusters with non-conflicting networks or, or rather rout routable networks between each of the pods so that the, the you know po a pod in cluster one talking to a pod in cluster two doesn't have to do anything special, just talk to the IP of that pod or that Kubernetes service and everything will be routable and everything will be fine. Another model is, the, uh, it is where the clusters are in separate networks. <laughs> and in that model, the, the, the workloads, they communicate with each other by first going through an ingress gateway, right? So to get to that other network, they, when, they, when they talk to another service under the covers, they get routed through to the ingress gateway and then that ingress gateway would pass the traffic through. Now, how does, how does this service here know that when it talks to a, a service B, that service B actually lives over on a different cluster? Well, Istio has something called the service entry. Right, and that's we 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 put that config uh, piece of config here, and we give it a name of, of B. Let's say there's a service B, and then when this particular proxy wants to talk to a service B under the covers, you know, it, using Istio, this redirection mechanisms, we're able to um, we're able to force the traffic to go to the ingress gateway that lives in in the second cluster. Um, so now this this model will happen. Um, when you're on different networks and you need to hop to different networks. Now there's another variant to the multi-cluster model, which is sharing or not sharing a control plane. Uh, in, this, in this case that we see here, we have two different clusters with two different Istio control planes. And the reason that I, I, we, we typically start out with this model is that it allows for various types of failure and isolation. So if this cluster goes down, we're not trying to share a control plane and this, that cluster can go down and not affect the, the other cluster. Um, okay, so then if we have separate control planes, then we need some way of telling the, work, telling the, the, the control plane in cluster one, we'll call this one cluster one and this one cluster two, that Hey, this is service. This is service A. Service A talks to service B, but that service B also lives over here on uh, on on cluster two, and the the routing that happens between service A and B over here, if this service were to fail, we need some way for for the service A pod to know that service B also exists over here and that to go through the ingress gateway. Now, I, I pointed out earlier that we can do that with service entries. Uh, basically, it's an entry into uh, uh, registry of service discovery registry that says, okay, well, service B is over here also. In 1.8, and although this, this capability had existed before, but it was officially documented in, uh, in 1.8, the model that, uh, it, it, that the docs suggest is to, um, Connect, connect cluster one to cluster two to, to its Kubernetes API, right? So we have the Kubernetes API here. 
And we also have a, uh, you know, the, the Kubernetes API in cluster one. And what, what the doc suggests is create a little, a little secret here on cluster one that knows how to authenticate to cluster two, do the same thing on cluster two back to cluster one and have them pull the, the endpoints for all the different services. And so if there are endpoints for service B over on, on cluster two and on, on cluster one, then Istio will know about that there's a service B on cluster two, right? And in this model, we don't have to create all of the different service entries and, and so on. Now, one of the, one of the challenges or uh, unfortunate side effects of this, is, as, as we've seen with uh, some of the folks who, who've adopted this model, is that it, the, the more clusters you have, let's, let's draw a couple more here, the more, and, and, and you want to federate the services across these different uh, clusters, the more you have to create these security tokens to talk to the Kubernetes API in the various clusters, right? So every cluster ends up having access to the Kubernetes API of any of the other clusters in that, that group. Right, if, if we're going to try to discover the services across those those clusters, and what we've what we found is that uh, operations folks, platform folks, don't like having those secrets spread around to every single cluster, and that every single cluster has access to every single other cluster, at least in terms of of, of its API. Um, and so, if we if we accept that, then we have to tell ourselves, what what is what is a different model? How how can we uh, if if we're going to solve the problem of service discovery, which, which we need to do. Um, and we don't want to share these secrets and shuffle them around because you could have a hundred clusters and, uh, that, and if one cluster gets compromised, then all of them potentially could get compromised. Uh, it's, not a very, it's not a very safe model. Uh, one, of the, one of the options that we've been working with, uh, with customers around is, um, let's see if I can go to, let's just go to this, this diagram. Um, is going back actually to the the model of, of placing the service entries where they should where, where they should go, and this has a couple of uh, advantages. One, instead of giving every cluster access to every other cluster, you could have something else. Some let's let's, let's call this a, a config config automator or whatever. Uh, and this this config automation can say, all right, cluster one. And cluster two, for the services that uh, that need to talk with each other, we will put service entries onto those cluster on, onto those clusters. And for the ones that don't need to talk, we won't we won't add the services. So we won't tell every we won't tell all of the clusters about all of the services. Only the ones that need to talk with each other. So we have a little bit more fidelity when it comes to actually uh, uh, paring down the amount of config that gets shared. Um, the second thing is now instead of all of the clusters knowing about all the other ones, uh, what we can have is, is a model where now only one, the config automator needs to know about how to access and push config to the various clusters, All right? So now we kind of go, go back and we're gonna, we're gonna have a little bit more control over what gets exposed and how it gets exposed. And we're gonna scope down the security um, surface or, or potential threat surface down to let's say a single uh, service, a, the, the config automator or orchestrator piece. Now. Even that has its own uh, drawbacks because there are uh, there's definitely large organizations where, uh, as I mentioned, they might get into the thousands of clusters, um, and so looking at it from a scalability standpoint as well as from a security standpoint, now we have one single component that has access to everything, um, and so that you know that that model may or, this model may or may not work for uh, for some folks, and uh, you know we we, we have we have. Uh, we're working with people where it does work for them and we have people that doesn't work for them and for those folks where it doesn't work instead of one single component knowing about uh knowing about everything and being able to communicate and talk with everything what we've what we've seen work is uh uh the, the opposite so instead of pushing these configs or you know, pushing the uh demanding security um being able to talk to all these different clusters from a single uh, spot. What we what we said is, why don't we push it? Why don't we have the clusters? Oops, wrong pen. Why don't we have the the clusters actually connect up to the management plane or, or some control uh, config control auto automation and say, hey, I'm cluster whatever. Why don't you give me the config that 
that, that I need. Uh, and so in this way, we have a much more decentralized and pull based model where a, a, a single component doesn't have, um, you know, access to everything. And the, uh, the security boundaries have then put, been pushed out to an, an individual uh, cluster so that if you get access to any one of them, you don't have access to everything. Uh, so let me, let me stop and just see, first of all, whether that, that, that makes sense to, to folks and see what, whether this is a problem for any of those folks running multiple clusters that they have run into and maybe how they've dealt with it differently. I'll just open it up for a sec. Hey, Christian, this is Lynn. I, I think it's really interesting you are describing this problem. Uh, certainly, there are some challenges I've also heard that um, there are concerns to allow even just read access, just to re, uh, allow the primary cluster to allow access to the remote cluster just on the read access for the API server. So mm -hmm. I've also heard uh, similar concerns on that. I, I think it's interesting how you guys uh, tackle this problem. I'm curious how you secure the, the connection and uh, the push from individual cluster to the configuration automation um, yeah. component. Definitely, yeah. So so far, I'm just trying to talk about the, the problem generally, um, and then I'll go into a little bit of uh, of how we're working with 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 folks to to solve this problem. Um, but yeah, just 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 first wanted to kind of lay the groundwork of what what's available, what what are some of the patterns, uh, what, what are some of the drawbacks, and and talk about it like that. But then yeah, I'm, I'll love to go into some of the stuff that we're we're specifically doing. Okay, great. But by the way, I really like this presentation style. It's yeah, like that was so gonna be my next real. question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any anyone else have uh, have, have thoughts or questions or, or acknowledgement that they're following along? This makes sense. Yeah, Vicente here from Zendesk Technology. It's uh, a task that we have on our backlog to build. We've been calling this internally a remote service reconciler, which was mm -hmm. your previous slide. That was the idea we had in mind. Without digging further. But yeah, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and looks like uh, we're going to need to revisit and, and reconsider that architecture that we planned. <laughs> yeah, sure. Happy to. Uh, happy to share. Yeah, okay. So that, that is a great segue to uh, another part of the, the problem, which I alluded to, but uh, can go into just, just slightly a little bit more, which is the configuration problem, right? Um, one, of the, one of the things I guess more just as anecdotally, what, what we see in some of the, the, the big uh, outages that make headlines and so on, and even in your own organizations, this may be uh, true as well, certainly has been in my past, where um, changes to the system typically consist of uh, more than just application code changes, right? There's uh, the, the more stuff we push into the infrastructure, the more, thi more things we lean on with configuration, uh, you know, config shuffling around configs, getting the configs right, and so on, configuration ends up being a gigantic reason why things fail or, or, uh, or take outages. Um, and, and so another part of this problem is how do you, it, it, it's not just, it's not good enough just to say, like, so for example, in Istio, if I need to configure a service in one cluster, I'm typically touching things like the virtual service, destination rules, sometimes a sidecar resource, um, and when I'm doing that across lots of different clusters, if they're all heterogeneous clusters, maybe the problem isn't as bad, but still we have to push the, I think those configs, identical configs out to the different clusters. Um, but if they're not, uh, you know, if, if, they're, if they're different clusters, if they are heterogeneous uh, uh, clusters, then, then the configs slightly change, right? And the direction of traffic is sort of implied in the configuration. And some, somehow that needs to be accounted for. Now, if you take this and, and spread it out to, um, let's say, a whole, a whole bunch of different clusters, now we have to shuffle these configs, make sure the implicit directionality and all of the, all of the other stuff is, is taken care of. Uh, that's Even if you had all of this put into your GitOps pipeline, there's, there's still a lot of moving pieces here. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me just switch back to the, this one. This is the one I wanted to be on anyway. Um, there's still a lot of moving pieces here and a lot of ways that, that things can go wrong. Go wrong. So uh, what we've been working with, uh, with folks on is how can, we, how can we simplify this a little bit and abstract this away a little bit um, so that the, the model that you use as a, as, a, as a user, right, 
is is a, a little bit more simplified and focused on what it is that you're trying to do with the platform as a whole, whether it's Istio or, or whatever, right? You're, you're, you're trying to orchestrate a release or you're trying to introduce, maybe you have like, maybe you have a bunch of different clusters running your application wor workloads and you have a separate cluster where you introduce Canary releases, All right? And in that separate cluster, you wanna get some traffic that's flowing in the rest of the system over to this, this separate cluster, this, this new Canary cluster, right? Uh, what you care about is doing the release, making sure the Canary works. You don't care where, you know, that the fact that there's a, there's a Canary cluster or, or more Canary clusters or the, the whole physical topology deployment isn't what concerns you as, at least as a, as a developer. Like I just want to release my service. I want to make sure that it's up. I want to make sure that if things start to fail, they fail gracefully that, uh, you know, in, in certain cases you take locality into, um, um, uh, into account and so on that, but, but the actual, whether there's virtual services on this cluster that match and service entries and so on, you focus on the, the, the part that matters to, to you. All right. And then that, that, that comes back to this, um, to this concept of the, you know, something that can manage that configuration, uh, something that can manage actually configuring clusters, the, the correct way with the right virtual services, with the right direction that everything needs to be configured in, um, but, but simplifying the model that the end user has to, has to worry about. Um, and so I, I guess without um, more drawing and stuff, why, why don't I get into the, uh, you know, what, what we've been working on and what we've been doing and how that fits with, with this problem. And then we'll extend that. We'll take a little bit of a shift and we'll extend this same problem and apply it to how we, uh, how we manage uh, customizations to the data plane, customizations to the, the service mesh itself. All right, so let's let me move this thing out of the way. Um, so what I'm going to show you real quick is, uh, so we, we, have a, we have a system, uh, let's see if I can bring this thing back up, that, that look, the architecture looks like this. All right, we have, a, we have a few different clusters and we have some piece that is smart enough about the configuration um, and, and can automate that configuration and has a, 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 a an API that users can can use to, to influence the, the different configs that, that end up getting sent down to these clusters. So if we just look real quick at the demo, we have two different clusters in this case running on GKE, cluster one, cluster two. They run some parts of the book info demo from Istio. You can see product page and details and reviews v1 and v2. In the second cluster, we see reviews v1, v2, and v3. So you can kind of think of uh, cluster two, maybe as our canary cluster, we're, we're introduced a new version of reviews. And we want to, <clears throat> from, from the rest of the traffic in the fleet, we, we might want a percentage of that to come to this canary cluster. And uh, you know, if th things fail at that cluster, then what, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll blow it away. So the first thing that, uh, that we want to take a look at is the app and make sure that it's working. Full host. 90, 80, move your product page, cross fingers. All right. So the normal working app that we have running, this happens to be in cluster one, but but the reviews v1 and v2 are in cluster one and cluster two. Uh, we refresh, we see it, re, re, reviews v1 and v2. That's, that's all normal. Um, but what we want to do is we want to, we want to release uh, reviews v3, and we want to do that in a canary fashion. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to use a, uh, an, an API, a little bit more simplified API, but it does take into account the fact that there are multiple clusters. Now you can be very explicit and actually name the clusters, or you can completely leave that out and it'll apply to all of the services across, you know, a fleet of clusters. But in this case, we do want to be explicit and say, well, uh, route, in this case, I'm going to choose a large number so we don't have to wait, keep refreshing, but uh, I'm going to route actually 75% of, of the traffic to any of the traffic coming into the review service to, uh, to the canary that would be running in cluster two. And this traffic policy resource, so this is the API that, that we came up with that us, uh, it actually, I was, I was about to say it suits most people, but it actually doesn't. <laughs> there's no one API that suits most people or everyone. And, uh, and, and there's, there's some reason behind this. Um, this API is actually customizable. You can change the shape of this API depending on who needs to use it. And I'll talk about that later. But um, so anyway, we have we have this traffic policy API that is 
a little bit more focused on who are the, what is the source of the traffic, what is the destination of the traffic, and what is the rule that needs to apply to that traffic. Um, so it's a little bit higher, a little bit more abstract on, on top of the SDO API, uh, but we can still do traffic shifting and, and that kind of thing. So let's apply this to our config automation, or what we call a management server management plane. Uh, and then when we come over here and cross our fingers and we refresh, we should see some traffic go to the red stars, which would be reviews v3. So it is going across from, from cluster one to cluster two because of this, this automation or because of the, this configuration. The automation under the covers. So if I take a look at our policies, we see our, our policy here. We've routed 75% of the traffic to a different cluster. That's all good. But under the covers, if we look at one of the, the, the service meshes, we see the correct virtual services, the correct service entries, destination rules, any of the envoy filters that we need to, uh, need to use here, uh, gateways and, and any of those things have automatically been created and put on the right cluster uh, where that, that particular mesh lives. So if we happen to look at uh, virtual service here, this is an Istio virtual service. Uh, we see indeed that uh, you know, the, the direction of traffic is, is set uh, correctly. Uh, so that's, that's an example. Uh, we're using a, a tool called Glue Mesh, which is an open source project and, uh, and specifically targeting the, this problem and, and, and more things, but this problem that we described here. And this can also be used to extend the capabilities of the mesh. So let me show you what that, what, what I mean by that. So I, it's, I, don't, I don't have time, and this is, a, again, another, another thing that we can talk about in, in detail or have it be its own session, but uh, you, if you've been watching Istio and Envoy and some of the stuff that's been happening around it with WebAssembly, you, you would kind of understand that WebAssembly can be used to customize the behavior of the proxy, and you can pick the language that you like for WebAssembly and, and write, the, write the functionality in that language. For the, you know, there's limitations, it's still emerging, um, but um, you know, that, that, is, that is a way to customize the, the proxy. Now the question is, how do you actually deploy that? I mean, it's nice in a demo to be able to just put it into a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, on the file system and hack the config to load it off the file system and so on, but across multiple nodes, across multiple meshes, how, how do you manage, or how do you deploy WebAssembly? Um, so I guess the first thing that we wanna do is before we, uh, deploy it is actually build a new WebAssembly module. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use some, some tooling that we have, but you can, you can use any tooling to build your WebAssembly module. Uh, I'm gonna choose uh, assembly script. We'll target Istio 1.8 and that will basically bootstrap for us a, a project that has all of the right, uh, all of the right versions uh, for the right, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> for the SDK that you might wanna uh, use for, uh, for writing your, your WebAssembly module. And it, it, it spits out a sample um, sample source code that you can go in and start start editing. Uh, in this case, we're gonna edit the uh, the headers on a response and we'll change, we'll add a header, hello world. That part, you know, that, that, that part's its own, again, its own topic. But um, let's try to build it. There's a chance, that, do I have Docker running? Let's find out. I actually didn't run through this. It was a bit off the cuff. Um, but what, what we're going to do here is we're going to build our WebAssembly module as an OCI image. And then from there, we can push it into a registry. Um, we'll give that, we'll give that a second. And then once it's pushed into a registry, then we can, then the question comes, all right, and how do I deploy this thing? Uh, so we built it and we have it. Let's go over here. Let's, uh, make sure that. Work gonna work, and then let's pop into this other. That, pop into this other demo, and what we're gonna see is if we make a call between a pod and the review service, we get we get a certain behavior, the out of the box behavior. We get the response that looks good. But what we want to do is install a WebAssembly module to change the behavior. In this case, simple demo of the, the response headers. What we're gonna do is we're gonna define using using some configuration where to apply this change, where this extension extensibility, where this extension should exist, and what module we want to we want to use and, and pull it from a particular repo. And so if we take this same this declarative model here and say, all right, we're gonna apply this to reviews v2, and 
as a running cluster one and apply it to our config automation server, management server. Um, then we should, once our config here is, we get the deployment itself, we should see the status. All right, it's been deployed. And now, if we try to call reviews, it might take a couple of tries because we applied it to reviews v2. Uh, and it's going to load balance between the two, so let's just try it a couple more times. Okay, then we see we do get the, the extension. We do get this this, uh, this change in, uh, in behavior uh, through, through WebAssembly. And so we can do that. We did this, we specified cluster one, but we could have specified any of the cluster, all of the clusters. Um, and in the, the way this is working is the WebAssembly module. So it wasn't baked into the image or anything like that. Uh, we dynamically loaded it at, at runtime and actually streamed the module over a, a, a secondary XDS channel that uh, was then able to dynamically load into the proxy and obviously here change the behavior of, of the proxy. Um, and I, I guess if we look back at the UI, you can see that there's uh, uh, this, is, this is something that we added to particular workloads and that uh, it's shown that it was installed. Uh, All right, so uh, I, was, I was hoping to come on and uh, see whether or not the iPad illustrations would work and share a couple of things that we've been working with our users, our customers here at Solo, and uh, and then show you what we're doing around WebAssembly and how that integrates with, with Istio. Well, that was pretty much what we had for you today from about service meshes and Istio. Thank you for being here, and we look forward to more sessions at CC Saturdays. Thank you.